The United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres says Russia and Ukraine must cease military activity near the Zaporizhia nuclear plant and agree on a security zone. He warned that any damage could, quote, spell catastrophe for the region and beyond. His words echoed those of the head of the UN nuclear watchdog reporting to the UN Security Council. It's Rafael Grossi's third time speaking to the Security Council, but his first time reporting on what he's seen with his own eyes at the Zaporizhia nuclear plant. We are playing with fire, and something very, very catastrophic could take place. This is why, in our report, we are proposing the establishing the establishment sorry, of a nuclear safety and a security protection zone. Grossi says it's not possible to work normally and safely at the plant. It's short-staffed, the staff it does have are overworked, and communication with the outside world is difficult. And, he says, military vehicles are getting in the way. Our concrete recommendation in this regard is that the military vehicles and equipment that are currently present in buildings, inside nuclear buildings, on the site, be removed. The Russian ambassador accused Kiev of shelling the plant and said there could be serious consequences. The responsibility lies solely with Kiev, its Western supporters and all those in the Security Council who don't have the courage to call things by their name and stop the reckless actions against this power plant. Despite Russia's song and dance here today to avoid acknowledging responsibility for its actions, Russia has no right to expose the world to unnecessary risk and the possibility of a nuclear catastrophe. Nothing new at the Security Council. Russia and Western nations at loggerheads once again, with no end to the conflict in sight. Let's bring in Sean Burney here. He's a senior nuclear specialist with Greenpeace and joins us from Scotland. Thanks for being with us. So, UN inspectors have now reported on what has happened at the Zaporizhia nuclear plant. What's your assessment? How dangerous is the situation there now? Well, there's important information in the IAE report, and it's perhaps maybe the first time that the IAE really e explained the scale of the, re the risk to the plant, the, using the words catastrophic to describe nuclear plants and safety is unusual for the International Atomic Energy Agency. They normally promote nuclear power. But it's, there's important evidence in here. I think we're concerned that there's not enough explanation about what the Russian government and the nuclear industry of Russia, Rosatom, are actually doing at the plant, which is effectively planning in these coming days to reconnect the plant to the Russian grid and effectively stealing a nuclear plant. The IEA is unfortunately silent on that. Stealing a nuclear plant, that's quite a prospect. Um, the UN has spelled out conditions needed to secure the nuclear facility. Are you confident that the necessary steps will be taken to make the plant safe? Well, unfortunately, all nuclear power plants have risks. This is a unique situation with a nuclear power plant in a full-scale war. The Russian ambassador shortly after the, the presentation at the Security Council last night said that it's not serious to consider a demilitarized zone. That effectively is only one step uh, towards the safety of this nuclear plant, which is demilitarization. UN Secretary General called explicitly for that. The Director General of the IEA, Mr. Grossi, has referred to a nuclear safety and security zone as far as the perimeter fence. That won't stop the damage that's being done by Russian shelling to the grid system, to the transmission lines that are essential for keeping the plant safe. Now, you're a nuclear expert. You deal with these sorts of things, the safety issues. Tell us, if something horrible does happen at the plant, what would be the consequences? Well, the range of consequences would be from limited uh, to extreme. Uh, and that really depends upon the, the, the sequence of events and the scale of radiological release. Unfortunately, the Zaporizhia plant, there's six nuclear reactors, but there are over 800 tons of highly radioactive spent fuel in the cooling pools. These are pools of water inside the reactor containment that must be kept cool. Otherwise, the water boils off and you start getting releases of radioactivity inside the containment, but that also can escape. For the reactor cores themselves, again, an enormous amount of radioactivity in the, in the fuel cores. 
The worst case scenario is that you end up with a nuclear meltdown similar to what you had in Fukushima. There are six reactors on the Zaporizhia site. Only one is currently operating at low power, but that in itself is hazardous because it's not stable. That reactor is, is operating to power the turbines and supply electricity to the plant because the, the site is cut off from the Ukraine grid at the moment. So it's an extremely dangerous situation. The consequences would be potentially very large contamination of southern Ukraine, but also beyond Ukraine into Europe. Sean Burney, nuclear specialist with Greenpeace, thank you very much for talking with us. DW's Matthias Berlinger joins me now from Kiev. Matthias, is there any indication that the warring parties are willing to comply with UN demands to secure the Zaporizhia nuclear plant? Well, Russia would have first to remove its military equipment from the plant. That's been stated very clearly in the report. And it has several uh, times said that uh, it is not willing to do so. It has also stated that the presence of its military forces there was actually making the plant safer, which is, of course, if we see all the fighting happening around there and the, and the dangers that military uh, proposed there, uh, has been refuted by uh, the International Atomic Energy authority. So um, uh, there are no uh, such undertakings. I don't see any any uh, way that this would happen. Um, if they would be willing, then we would have to talk about what guarantees Ukraine would be giving. But I don't see that um, anything like that is happening now. I might be wrong, but I don't see that this will be fulfilled. Matthias, talk to us about Ukraine's counter-offensives. We know that President Zelensky met with his top military leaders last night. What can you tell us about those offensives in the south and the east? So we have heard several uh, news during the past few days about the counter-offensive in the south taking shape. It's still early to say to talk about whether it can succeed or not. Uh, but we have seen that the Ukrainian military seems to be uh, applying a lot of pressure in the south, and there have been. Uh, uh, um, uh, some successes, some villages uh, taken back under control by the Ukrainians. Um, but uh, what is new now is that we have also news from the east, especially from the Kharkiv region, that there is an offensive going on there. There might be several reasons for that. First of all, I mean, there have been pushes or like pressure applied to these uh, uh, parts of the front line before, but uh, one thing might, one of the reasons of for starting this now or for pushing harder now uh, might be that uh, Ukraine wants to prevent Russia from moving equipment and soldiers from the north, from the east uh, to the south, um, and uh, that's why they might not be attempting at a breakthrough there, but they might want just want to keep them engaged. Matthias, thank you so much. Our correspondent, Matthias Berlinger, there in Kiev.